Village Museum. It's the region's only year-round immersive haunted history experience. Uh, she's a published playwright. She's traveled the nation directing and producing documentaries uh, for stage and screen. Uh, she possesses undergraduates, undergraduate degrees in political science and theater and a master's from New York University. Uh, she's worked for global nonprofits, Penn Public Policy, uh, for four-way touring theater companies and taught both college and high school. Uh, she's done a lot for uh, a young woman. Uh, by day, she works in the fashion industry, uh, which is not ghost whispering. You can find Violet writing Yuri poetry, organizing for political change, or rescuing and rehabilitating a serpentine familiars. And now, I already told you about her, but please give me a warm welcome. Uh, Violet also brings with her her assistant, Jonathan Brown. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Violet Shinma and Jonathan Brown.
And that night, when we put up all the tour dates for 2022, they sold clean out. To this day, every single tour we've hosted since 2022 has been a sold out tour. So although it is spooky season, Halloween is not just a holiday, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> and there are lots of people who want to talk to ghosts all year long. And so we've been super fortunate to host this incredible program, which the thing I'm singularly the most proud of is since the origin of this program, there has been a steady upward trajectory in annual memberships for Heritage Village Museum and Edu Education Center. So something we're gonna talk about tonight, because I know you're all preservationists, and I know you all take your own bite out of history here at Del High. We're gonna talk about the bridge between the paranormal and historical preservation as an active practice, and how we do that out at Heritage Village. I guess I'm gonna need this. Ooh. You guys can hear me, right? Okay.
Everybody hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So again, my name is Jonathan Brown. I've actually been doing paranormal research and investigation since about 2007. And that started when I was stationed in uh, Omaha, Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base. I spent six, six years in the service. My first four was uh, aircraft maintenance on the RC-135 and E-4B. Has anyone ever heard of E-4B? They called it the Flying Pentagon. Made me nervous to fly. <laughs> but, and in Omaha, I started with some very basic things, digital recorders and a very technically driven method to investigate the paranormal. I picked up a few EVPs. That's what they call electronic voice phenomenon. And that passion for the paranormal sort of continued with me to Ohio where I spent some time for my last two years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And as many people know, Wright-Patterson is heavily associated with Area B, our UFO retrieval. They say, you know, what, what was it, the, uh, the Roswell crash was bought there. I can't confirm that, but I can confirm Area B had some very unusual things about it. It was an interesting base to be at. Um, from there, I spent a lot of time up in Fairborn and Middletown doing paranormal investigations with various groups. Uh, the last group I was a part of was, uh, has anybody ever heard of Victory of Light? It is a psychic medium festival they used to hold in Sharonville. And I was in their group for about two and a half, three years where I got a chance to work with a lot of psychic mediums, empaths, and things like that. And then uh, from there, I continued my passion for the paranormal to where I am today. I spend a lot of time personally reading parapsychology books and the experimentations they've done and the things they've done with the paranormal as well as heavy in technology, uh, audio engineering and things like that, and uh, ESP, which is a branch of parapsychology. When we talk about mediumship and sensitivity, spiritual sensitivity, that plays a large part into ESP, which is, many of you probably heard of that, extrasensory perception and things like that. And so for the last year and a half or so, I've been doing quite a bit of work with Violet at Heritage Village and continuing my research. I won't hold you up for too long because we'll have other questions that we'll let you guys ask, but I'll let her get back on with her presentation. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. I'm getting some concerned looks from the back of the room, which probably means you can't hear us. Yeah, okay. Well, although the microphone, Powerful, so I love it. All right, well, I'll miss you guys, but I'm going to be back behind the microphones in the back of the room. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Awesome. When I first arrived at Heritage Village Museum in 2022, like I said, I sent out a call for stories, and there was an outpouring of oral histories from the local community. I got to sit down with longtime volunteers at the village, a couple of which we have with us tonight. I got to sit down with many generations of employees from the village, guests at the village, community members from across Sharonville, park rangers and Sharonville police officers, and local descendants of the Miami and Shawnee tribal leaders and medicine men had done their work in that area 100, 200 years prior, and still have a tribal claim to that land. Seeing as today is Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, I think it's nice that we kind of start our program tonight with something which was said to me by a great granddaughter of a Miami tribal medicine man. She said, Violet, there is no death just a changing of worlds. I'm going to say that again. There is no death, just a changing of worlds. This is our operating theory when we do the work we do at Heritage Village Museum. I know you were all hoping I'd get on this hot mic and talk about shadow people crawling across the ceiling and banshees wailing through the night and uh, poltergeists hurtling chairs across the room. Sorry. If we had that, we'd charge more than $35 a ticket. I've ever given on the paranormal. I'm used to 
is that if there is no death, just a changing of worlds, the village is a zone where we can witness that change. It's an intersection between those worlds, however many there are. And as they cross and dance and mingle, as they overlap, we get to witness them overlapping, however momentarily, in the village. Now, probably the second question I get asked the most, other than what makes you a ghost whisperer, is what's a ghost? Well, this is the part of the night where I tell you that everything that is about to come out of my mouth, everything, no matter how many degrees I have, is highly, highly, highly theoretical. And if anyone stands in front of you and tries to sell you any version of these ideas, like it's fact, that is a snake oil salesman of the highest form. This is all theoretical, so please feel free to take this home with you, pull it apart, put it back together, and try it on for size. These are all theories. But something that's not theory, physics, the first law of thermodynamics, energy once created can never be destroyed. Energy once created can never be destroyed. So if the human consciousness and its energy once created can never be destroyed, where does it go after we die? Does it explode like a star and various pieces of it scatter and go to all of the places it remembers? Think right now. If tonight was the last night and little bits and pieces of your consciousness got to go everywhere, where would you go? You'd go to your favorite place. You'd also go to that place where you have unfinished business. You'd go everywhere. And you'd come back and you'd go everywhere again. So, if energy once created can never be destroyed, the village, like everywhere, is simply collecting little bits and pieces of the human consciousness which came before us. After its vessel, its human body, has been destroyed, its energy is still spilling into all of these spaces, and after our death, our energy is simply redistributed. This is the simplest way I can put it. That's a ghost. A ghost is a redistribution of our energy after our bodies have been destroyed, but our energy, after being created, can never be destroyed. It's simply redistributed. In Heritage Village, we work with two kinds of haunts. Now, I know the word haunt is misleading with how lovingly I'm about to talk about ghosts, but it's exciting, so we'll call it haunts. We work with active and residual haunts. A residual haunt is like a moment in history being recorded and then played back to you on loop over and over and over again. Some people say, damn, that sounds terrible to be trapped in that loop forever and ever. And you don't really think of it like that. I investigated a home where a woman had passed away and her favorite thing to do was to tend to her garden. Well, if you wake up at sunrise every single day, you can see her out there tending to her garden every single day. And no matter how hard the frost hits the garden every winter, every spring, a couple tulips break through. So no, residual haunts are not always a trap. It's not always someone stuck in a loop doing that thing that killed them or the thing they hated again and again and again. Sometimes it's someone come back to pray every single night in the spot where their family Bible would sit at the bedside table like it is at the Kemper Law Home. The Kemper Law Home was built by one Reverend James Kemper, who was the first Presbyterian minister to preach his mission north of the Ohio River. He sailed down the Ohio River with 14 children and three horses on two flatboats. And then on June 4th of 1804, the night he threw a housewarming party to celebrate the completion of his law home, his 15th and final child was born. From 1804 to 1891, this house sat in what is today the Walnut Hills neighborhood. 
That night, the Reverend James Kemper finished his log home. It said that he walked through his living room and looked out the back windows, and he saw more than 100 acres of walnut trees, and so he gave the place a nickname. He nicknamed it Walnut Hill. If you've ever been on Kemper Road or Kemper Lane, that's where his name's in. And in fact, the Somerset Church, which we rescued from near destruction where it sat on Mason Montgomery Road, which hosted an active congregation of more than 200 plus Presbyterian congregants until the early 2000s, was one of the first churches he built in the Walnut Hills area originally and then moved. And we saved it and moved it to the village. Now it sits next to his family home. Well, one night in, I guess this was June of 2022, we were investigating the Kemper Log home, and we were upstairs, and at the top of the steps on one side of the Kemper Log home, the top of the very steep steps faces the entryway to what looks like a closet. We were working with the SLS. This is a selective laser sensor camera. If you've ever watched Ghost Adventures or Kindred Spirits, you've seen this thing. This is the stick figure camera. This camera measures infrared, ultraviolet, and thermal, all things visible to the human eye. When a human is on the other side of the lens, they look like a stick figure. When there is no human on the other side of the lens, you should see nothing. You might see a gradient, like looking through a thermal camera, but you certainly should not see points or a stick figure. There should not be enough infrared, ultraviolet, or motion for the camera to plot any points to. Well, we were pointing the camera at the entryway to what looked like a closet upstairs in the Kemper Law home and a figure up here. And it kind of grew and shrank, grew and shrank, and then it got really still, and you could see a head, a neck, two shoulders, a torso, legs, and arms. And then it bent down and appeared to scoop something up off the ground, and its arms made a triangle across the top quadrant of its body. That's when someone turned on a flashlight, shone it over top of the camera, and we noticed we had the camera pointed at an artifact baby bassinet. So someone in the group said, I'm very sorry if we've woken the baby and we'll go now. And just like that, she disappeared. Well, when I brought that story back to Steve Preston, the executive director of Heritage Village Museum, he said, Violet, that's not a closet. That's a bedroom. It's the bedroom which was built for Charles Kemper, the youngest of the Kemper boys, the baby born that night in June of 1804. It's where him and his wife, Juliet Kemper, raised their baby, Helen Kemper. And when the Kemper Log Home made it to Heritage Village Museum in 1973, in thousands of pieces, all that historians had to piece it back together was Helen Kemper's drawings of her childhood home. So, these spaces hold on to hope. And unfortunately, I won't be talking very much about demon night crawlers uh, scaling the ceiling tonight. But, in the Kemper Law home, we have a residual haunt that is always, always standing in front of the bedside table in one of the upstairs bedrooms kind of at the foot of the bed in front of the bedside table. Now, when I had historian Jim Smith, who actually wrote a book on the Kemper family, take me through the Kemper log home on a pseudo historical or pseudo investigation, I said, why would there be this figure constantly in front of the bedside table upstairs in the Kemper log home? And he said, well, the Kemper family would have been a very pious one the bedside table would have been where the family Bible was. And so every night, they would come to the bedside table, they would pull the Bible from the bedside table, and they would probably kneel at the bedside to pray, or write, or read, or sing. This was probably a ritual for them. 
It was probably the one thing that no matter how hard the harvest was that year, or how violent the local skirmishes between the Miami and the Shawnee tribes got that year, how uncertain life was, they could do this thing every single night and it brought them a sense of peace. Gave them a sense of belonging. So this residual haunt appears all the time to stand by the bedside table. Now, the opposite of a residual haunt, which is typically kind of in this loop where they're in their own world, they may be minimally aware of you, but not so much is an active haunt. We used to have a theory that the village was 75% residual, 25% active haunts. I think we've since reversed that theory. An active haunt is aware of you, is aware of themselves. They often know where they are and why they're there. They often know that time has passed and they sometimes know that they have died. They can say your name, Jonathan and I don't ever enter the village without hearing our names come through the radio synthesizers. They can often tell you the game. And they can tell you all kinds of other stories. Most haunts fall in one of these two categories, active or residual haunts.
It also brought a massive network of collaborators from the Sharonville community to the village. It brought park rangers back to the village. It brought Sharonville police officers back to the village. It brought local Shawnee and Miami tribal folk back to the village. I'll tell you guys another ghost story. That gorgeous Carpenter Gothic house in the very first slide, that's the Elk Lake Estate. Some people refer to that as the crown jewel of Heritage Village. Where that sat in the East Fork community of the Little Miami River, the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1970s went into that area to dam up the river to make space for what is today William P. Harsha Lake. Their plan was to sink the Elk Lake Estate to the bottom of the lake. Their plan was just to put it in a watery grave. But Heritage Village saved it and brought it piece by piece by piece to Sharon Woods and reassembled it like a jigsaw puzzle. And today, it's one of the last surviving true Carpenter Gothic estates in this region. It was originally built in 1818, and it was once the home of Senator Thomas Morris, who's kind of a forgotten US revolutionary and was actually the first legislator to introduce anti-slavery and abolition legislation on the Congress floor in the 1830s. The Elk Estate, it used to be the responsibility of the park rangers to lock it up every single night. They used to go in, turn off all the lights, lock the door, and close the shutters. And then they would walk down the gravel path and get back in their cruiser. Well, when I sat down with 12 active and retired lady rangers and Sharonville police officers, they all told me the same story. They said, from the 70s, when the Alcoa State arrived at Heritage Village until the early 2000s, they would walk into the Alcoa State. They would roam its gorgeous, sprawling halls. They would turn off the lights. They would come out. They would lock the door, they would walk the perimeter, and they would close the shutters. They would walk back down the gravel path and get back into their cruisers. And by the time they got back behind the wheel, they would turn around to see all the lights on, the shutters open, and the door ajar. This spawned a multi-generational pact between the Sheridan police officers and the park rangers never to step foot in the public estate. So you know who the fearsome little lady ranger is now who locks it up every single day? I'm just kidding, I'm way not deserving of a badge. But it was this story that led us to do a lot of our early investigating in Oak Lake. Would they go back a second time and get them off No. Now, I mentioned that all of these structures, they have been saved, and they, they have. Something that makes Heritage Village Museum really cool and very unique is it's a shelter. It's a sanctuary for historic landmarks. Anywhere where there is a historic home or building that is in danger of becoming victim to a natural disaster, or being bulldozed to build some yucky movie theater where they serve you sushi and wine in your seat, or becoming rubble at the bottom of a hill, like the Kemperlock Holmes did when the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden Gardens gave up on it. They've been saved and brought to Heritage Village. And the building materials have been taken very carefully and reassembled so as to preserve them in their complete and total authenticity. This means all those natural earthen materials are there, all that ancient wood and that stone. In the field of the paranormal, we work with something we call the stone tape theory. This is a theory that says natural materials, wood, stone, anything earthen, it acts like a conduit for energy, like a little tape recorder. It records moment in time, and then it plays it back to you again and again and again. So in Heritage Village, 
you have 13 perfect examples of the stone tape theory. Man-made materials, on the other hand, like what we're surrounded by right now, does the opposite to energy. It blocks it, it buffers it. The other thing that makes Heritage Village and really all of Ohio incredibly unique from a paranormal standpoint, I've been really lucky to investigate haunted locations all across the nation. I am not actually a Cincinnatian. I know this is like a dangerous thing to say in Cincinnati. Um, next, you guys will start asking me, like, Skyline or Bold Star or some weird, like, chilly question, which I won't have an answer to because I've been vegetarian for a long time now. But um, Ohio has a disproportionate amount of limestone in its sediment. Limestone is believed to be a conduit for supernatural activity. Sharon Gorge and Sharon Woods, it has a waterfall feature with multiple waterfalls and gorges that cut into the earth and leave exposed sediment facing the village. In that exposed sediment are layers and layers and layers of open limestone. So, I was kind of the envy of a lot of my paranormal buddies when I said, yeah, I love to do my work in Ohio now. And they're like, oh, limestone heaven. <laughs> yeah, Ohio is truly special because of the limestone in its, settlement from a, in its sediment from a paranormal standpoint. Do you have anything to add to that? As far as like <laughs> geological significance? Somebody came back 
for their luggage. Chester Park is home to a collection of, I believe the number is nearly 30 artifact trunks, all from the 19th century. And these are not Walmart pieces of luggage. These are gorgeous trunks, wooden with art inside, truly beautiful, and all of them handmade. So think about all of the energy that these trunks carry with them and how they might be conduits for ghosts.
and then from there we can go and we can try and debunk it. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so, we can. Yeah. Are you scared? So, uh, so here, you can see the person here and the, and the graph that's laid out on it. Typically what we're looking for is an item within the background that typically would not be recognized by the programming of the SLS to see something that should not be there and then a figure to be formed off of it. And from there, we begin to interact with it to see if it has behaviors associated to, to our conversation. Um, another device that we use... Before we uh, move on from the SLS, what you guys are looking at, just so you know, on your right, right on our right, that's a, that's a human. There's one human in front of the camera. Okay. One human. There's one human. On the left, if there's no human there, what is that? And that's typically how we work with the SLS. And I'm sure some of you who are looking at it closely enough notice what it's doing. What is that little figure doing? It's waving. That little one is saying hello. We have pointed our SLS at the rooms all across the village to watch. Figures just like this emerge to do everything from dance to pray to cook meals to cradle babies. And this, this little one on this particular night was giving us a wave. So the next, uh, some other items we use are, what do you call it, the Vox? Yeah. The Vox. So the Vox, what it does with the, since it's on the uh, phone, is it uses all the sensors within the phone to make measurements based on the, the location that you're in. And what happens in the background is the actual application is scanning over radio stations. So the term for this, through parapsychology, there's two forms of EVP. There is live voice EVP, which the box does. And the other one is transforming EVP. I don't want to talk too much about this. Like I said, I'll talk about it all night. But when we use radio speed, this is a form of live voice EVP. And the application is designed that when it reaches specific parameters based on what you see in the room, electromagnetic fields, or EMF, it could be geomagnetic, um, it'll trigger the device to speak. Sometimes you're going to get radio stations through that sound like radio stations, and those are easy to dismiss. What we want when we communicate through these devices is things that are within context. Uh, for instance, we were in the Kemper Law Park. We're in the uh, dining room, not the dining room, the child's room. And we're having conversations about the crib, like we're speaking to the mother, and then we're saying something to the effect that we're talking about the baby. Well, the device starts bringing up conversation related to a baby. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it said things that would concern the care of the baby. It said things that would concern like what the child was wearing, these are the instances when these devices give us things that we can consider legitimate. Now, if you take everything that we get as a whole, we're going to throw out about 95% of it, if not more. But what counts for us is that inside of these conversations, we're getting topics, we're getting responses that relate to what we're saying. And many times, the things that we get, you just, you're not going to find on a radio station. They're not cursing a lot, they're not talking. They're not talking specifically about babies and, and things like that. So we use these devices primarily during our tours because one, they do give us results, and two, their live voice interpretation is much easier through live voice as opposed to traditionally what I like to use is the um, transform EVP, which you've all heard of with a digital recorder or a tape recorder, and I go home and I sit for hours on Audacity to hear ghost speak. Both forms work, both give us results. That's another thing. So the next time you're bored in a quiet room, pull your phone out and hit record, and go home and play the recording back and see if you can find any voices that come back on the recording that weren't in the room. Yeah, a lot of what I do with my video recording now is off my old Samsung because I've seen it and I've seen it consistently. I guess I should say I've heard it. I've heard it consistently. The Samsung video recording picks up voices. I just came from Trans Allegheny. 
uh, lunatic asylum in the old in the old woman's ward, and they speak. I've picked up the voices in Heritage Village too, so, and your videos will pick up the voices. It, it takes a trained ear, but electronic voice phenomenon is, is real, and I can prove it. We <laughs> so, have a mango.
Juliet Kemper holding baby Helen upstairs in her childhood bedroom. That could have actually not been Juliet and Helen. Rather, that could have been the mother who owned that artifact baby bassinet in the early 1800s and rocked her baby to sleep every night in it, picking her baby up out of its cradle. We like to imagine as historians, since we've worked so hard to preserve the Kemper Law home, that it is in fact the Kempers there to continue enjoying their family home. But the attachment there, the energy there, could have easily been to that artifact baby bassinet. So I could never give you a specific example because it would be an assumption at best. Um, but I think that's a good example of how object-oriented attachments tend to work. Yes. What is your favorite building on the whole campus to like work in? So she said that what is our favorite building on the whole campus to work in? Go first. Me? That's difficult for me because over the last month to two months I've had things shift quite a bit for me in terms of activity in the main buildings. But I can say from a research standpoint, I have a device, an application I use, which from uh, the Bear, uh, the e Association of EVP, it's a like a British association, and I've been doing ongoing research in the Kemper Ball home. And the conversations I've had in there have actually been continuous and I've been able to identify some rather intelligent things that are there. So right now, the Kemper Law Home is at home for me, but the Elmwood House is coming up. So that, that, that house is asking things happen. Thank you for this question. Um, I have a definite answer. Um, my favorite house at Heritage Village Museum is the Bordes House. It's kind of overlooked because it's a very simple farmhouse. It's built in the federal style, and the assumption it was built sometime in the 1820s. Um, the actual papers, architectural papers and family papers, were destroyed in a fire at the Hamilton County Courthouse in March of 1894. So what little we know about the Voorhees House and the Voorhees family is what historians and researchers have pieced together. Um, the house belonged to Jane and Samuel Voorhees, who raised 13 children there. They had 14, but she died when she was less than a year old. Um, it was originally on more than 100 acres of farmland, mostly corn, but also sheep. And Samuel died young. He left Jane with all that land and all those children. And in the summer of 1863, one John Hunt Morgan gathered up 2,460 cavalrymen and put them on horseback. They took a midnight ride, which became what we know today as Morgan's Raid. This was angry, growing racism and the early seeds of the Civil War gathered together to antagonize, to intimidate, grow, growing union sentiment north of the Ohio. Um, on their ride through Cincinnati, they set a huge part of Camp Denison ablaze, and they made many stops. And one of the many stops they made in June of 1863 was right to the front door of the Voorhees house, where Jane Voorhees managed to keep herself and all 13 of her children safe. And she did it as a single mom. Now, the Voorhees house is unique for a number of reasons, but it's one of the only places on the premise where I've actually seen a full body apparition. I've seen the apparition of what the executive director of the village believes to be Samuel Voorhees, Samuel Jr. Voorhees, the oldest of the Voorhees children. The only thing we know about that night in 1863, and the only way we know that Morgan's Raiders stopped at Jane's front door, is we have the filing where Samuel Voorhees filed with the U.S. government for reparations for three stolen horses that Morgan's Raiders stole from Jane. It's in Samuel's name because Samuel was the oldest man of the family at the time. And we believe that the apparition we saw is Samuel in the front room of his family home, guarding it forevermore. 
just in case any more raiders decide to show up. But we have had incredible REM pod activity in that house. We have used a motion detector and put it in the middle of an empty room and walked away from it. And now think of like a little, like it's like hockey puck sized and shaped. And the field is conical. Think of like an upside down ice cream cone on top of a hockey puck. It's a really tight field. And that's how you know that it's not getting tricked arbitrarily. So it's a really good tool to work with because it'll measure motion and it's really, really close to the hockey puck. So you can move on the other side of the room and it's not going to pick you up. But if something comes and touches that hockey puck, it lights up like a Christmas tree. I can count on both hands the amount of times we have set up the red pod in Voorhees house and begun to ask questions about John Hunt Morgan and his raiders and picked up motion when it was just the two of us in the room and we were on the other side of the room. So yeah, the Morty's house is my favorite. Um, another, another quick ghost story. Every October um, during Haunted Village, I read tarot and oracle cards for all of the children and their families that attend our annual Halloween fundraiser there. The very first year I was there, it was actually before I was serving as Heritage Village's in-house paranormal historian. A young boy, about 10 years old, walked into the back room of the Morty's house, and he looked at me, and he doesn't know who I am, certainly doesn't know I talk to ghosts. Thinks I'm probably just an actor in a costume, and He's a, some like, you know, all day version of Disneyland. Um, and he looks at me and he says, Hey lady, do you believe in ghosts? And I thought, well, it's Halloween, you know, it's a 10 year old kid, got a little piece on So I said, I don't know, kid, why? And he says, Because I can feel them all around me. I can feel them here in this house. And I can hear them upstairs. I hear their little feet above me. And then he starts counting. One, two, three, four. And he counts all the way up to 13 and stops. So I look at his mom for some sort of confirmation of his overactive imagination. And mom's face is white as a ghost, unattended. Son is dressed as a ninja. Mom is not a ninja. Her face is super pale. And in a voice like barely, barely above a whisper, she says to me, he's never like this. So children really pick up on the energy of the Voorhees house, and they seem to really pick up on the Voorhees children. Um, those are just, there are so many reasons why I love that house, but those are just kind of two. One, one specific example, a couple specific examples. Sir? Negative energy. 
uh, oftentimes when it comes to discerning between negative energy and positive energy, I always refer to the fact that most spirits are ghosts having disposition, just like we do. Some days we are lovable people. Some of us are morning people, some are not. Some of us are upset because something made us mad. Others of us don't get mad that easy. So when it comes to dealing with the uh, spirits there, and in general, I like to sort of be cautious and say they're just an individual having an experience. But in terms of to sort of stay in line with what she's asking and to relate negative potentially to something malevolent, I've never felt that at Heritage Village. I appreciate this question. This is a version of this question that comes up for us a lot in the work that we do. Um, I'm going to kind of tease our idea of negative here a little bit. Um, good and evil, those are human constructs. These are human ideas, these are human narratives, human discourses about human behavior that have been more or less created by very human institutions. So that people behave and build societies along certain lines, comply and conform, to certain ideas of what makes a good and what makes an evil person. Good and evil doesn't really pertain to the spirit world as we work with it. Um, the spirit world, and our best guess, is like a reflection of the mortal one, but not just one reflection, like a fun house of mirror reflections of the spirit world which means that sometimes you will encounter someone on their worst day. I'm sure all of us have had a bad day and did something we kind of regret, but that didn't make us an evil person. That was just a bad day. So, again, it would be super fun and probably worth more than 35 bucks a ticket if there were wailing banshees flying down the main path of the village, screeching into the if there were gargoyle-like spirits looming over the village, it would be awesome oh, well, for us. But, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is not the case. Um, and any time that we have tricky, tricky is the word I'll use, we have complex interactions where we suddenly feel a heaviness. What I think, more often than not, as a paranormal investigator, we're contending with, we're encountering, it's actually grief. A lot of people come to investigate the paranormal so that they have another way of grieving. And there's nothing more human than grief. So, I, I think that's a large part of what we're contending with. And also, life wasn't all too comfortable in the 1800s. This was an era before modern medicine. This was an era plagued by war. Life was not comfortable, it was tough. It was tough, tough life, and most of the families who lived at the homes in Heritage Village were farm families who tended to a field for 12 long hours. It really humbles me. So when I encounter something in the village which feels negative, I think of how tough life must have been. And instead I change kind of the questions I'm asking, and I change my approach, and I see if that kind of softens the air a little bit. So, really quick to add on something that might relate. So, in a lot of the research I've done, there is an advancing theory on my part that a lot of what you see in these areas with the spirit inhabitants, they actually operate and they can interact with each other to an extent. And I've actually seen growing evidence that they operate almost like a system, like a village, like a household like a city, and there is some level of governance behind them that they operate under. And sometimes one thing or one individual will keep the group from speaking and things like that. So it, it's a complex uh, conversation. Any more questions? I'm sorry, sir. I'll get something to you back there. Uh, if, we, we were focusing so much on how we wanted to present, but if we ever see you at the village, I, I have a bunch, and then I have a bunch on my YouTube channel also. Sir? You've referenced a bunch of times tonight about asking questions.
questions. I assume that means having conversations with kids. What are you asking? So he, he wanted to know about the questions we keep bringing up and the conversations that we have with the spirits and the ghosts. And typically, we call these EVP sessions. And the conversations that we have are very typical to the conversations you would have with anyone that you're sitting at a table with. Um, the big thing about Heritage Village is before you go in any home, she's going to give you the rundown of the history. She's going to tell you everything about the home, what to be aware of, what happened in it, like she just did with the Morty's home. And so when you go into the home and you have the EVP session, you use that history as a supporting stone to have those conversations. You know, what was it like when General Morgan's Raiders came in? How did you manage all those, uh, all those children being the women of the home? Um, how do you feel? Are you happy? Are you sad? It, it, it can either come down to questions based on just the history. It can come down to questions where you're sort of probing to see if you have an intelligent consciousness talking to you or not. It can also come down to more philosophical questions. Their spiritual beliefs. Do they still believe in a higher power? You know, it can come down to questions about their material makeup. Do you have a body? If you don't have a body, well, how do you operate? How does your consciousness operate? So typically in an EVP session, those are the conversations that you'll have. And then when you get the questions back, how I was saying earlier with the, uh, Radio Suite Live voice device that we use, we look for content. If we're asking about his body, then we get a question talking about the weather, or, excuse me, a response talking about the weather. That's how we run our sessions. Is there context, is there intelligence in the answers? And that's how we start to figure out if we have a residual hunting or an intelligent hunting. Because a residual hunting will appear and present differently than an intelligent hunting when it comes to the electronic voice and a residual hunting, we may hear through the device a response that mimics a situation happening within the house. Like if someone got into a fight, if someone was talking about dinner, it will come through as a snippet of a conversation as opposed to an intelligent hunting where it would come through as a direct response to a question or they would talk about something that was more aligned with what we were asking. And the simpler the better. Yes. You know, it's the simple questions that elicit the marvelous responses. Do you, do you, what's your favorite holiday? Are you excited for Christmas? What's your favorite season? Um, what's your favorite meal? Um, tell me about your husband. Um, tell me about your favorite dress. Sing me your favorite song. <laughs> it's funny, talking to ghosts is Talking to dead people is really a lesson in being alive. <laughs> um, any more questions? I think you had your hand up earlier, too. Do oh, you guys this. do any uh, cleansing or protection before you go in and then cleanse them when you're done? So she's asking if we do any cleansing or protections before we go in and when we leave. Uh, typically for me, I, I, I go in there a certain, a certain manner. Um, I'm just, I sort of say thanks, and I'm respectful of what goes on there. In terms of like overall cleansings, I, I have things that I wear, or I, I've never been a big, big on like a, imagining anything, but for me, I haven't brought anything home from Heritage Village and our, our developed relationship, our developed relationship with the property has sort of kept me balanced, so for me, and that site, no. Other sites, yes. You'll notice that um, we didn't call ourselves ghost hunters. As kind of cool as it sounds. This is the approach that keeps me safe. I have never and will never call myself a ghost hunter. This is not a hunt. I don't think of myself as a predator, and I don't think of spirits as prey. I think of myself as an observer and a historian. And I think that my job is not actually really to be some grand diplomat between the moral and the spirit realm, but rather just to be a good listener and to be a good community member. And that starts by honoring my ancestors. And 
This is the approach that keeps me safe. This humble approach, this open approach, this approach that I don't wield any power in my mortality. And that we have a relationship where we will listen to one another and share with one another. And I know this isn't as kind of glorified as like the Zach Baggins ghost hunter uh, methodology, if you could call it a methodology. But it is the approach that has kept me safe this long. And it's the approach that I'll continue taking because I think it's what keeps me safe, my humility, when I go into these spaces. Also, I have never, ever, ever entered one of these buildings without knocking. Even when I know there's no human inside, I will always knock. Sometimes I go back to my own apartment, I'm the only person who lives there, and I knock on my own door. I always knock. It's the little things. You knock, you announce yourself, you say, excuse me. You thank them for the time they spent with you that evening. I think that's probably more than all the time we have, although time is a human construct. <laughs> thank you all so much.